Innovators. I am Dustin Miller, Poly Innovator. Today I'm talking with Richard Musket, the founder of Fatal Blog, Climate Pulse, Kick One, and Impact Makers. Thank you for joining me on the Polymath Polycast. Thank you for having me. So you're a technologist, engineer, marketer, executive who's turned his focus to solving climate problems that we are generating as a species. Now, I personally love this because this is something I've always been trying to focus on this too. It's been my main ethos in life. And so for 10 years now, I've been trying to make content around making a change. And this whole idea of climate change is something that really interested me from you as well. So you have created a community around this idea called Impact Makers, which is actually something similar to something I did too. So we'll get into that later. Hello and welcome to the Polymath Polycast. So this is a show by Poly Innovator. Please say hello to the innovators in the audience. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, that's a fantastic intro. Thank you. It's nice to hear. Um, I, I will correct one thing, though, that the Impact Makers uh, community wasn't founded by me. Okay. Um, it was founded by somebody else about a year and a half ago, and I've sort of jumped in um, to kind of uh, help run it or take over running it. Um, so I want to make sure right from the get-go that that's, that that's clear. Um, yeah. But yeah, otherwise, um, thank you for the great intro. It's nice to hear. Thank you for correcting me. I think that particularly this, the listing of founding, I, I found her at the Fatal Blog, but I should have had that at the end so that way the other things didn't sound like, yeah. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Well, thank you for joining me on the Polymath Polycast. It's really fun to have you here. The way I like to break the ice is to have you share something about yourself that no one knows about you. That's, that's, a, that's a great way to break the ice. <laughs> <laughs> um, it kind of dumbfounds you in a way. You're like, oh, I didn't see that coming. But like, once you break that ice, once you answer the question, everything else feels easy from then on. You know, the, the, one of the first things that popped to mind, which is maybe not the most sort of uh, upbeat way of citing this, but it has, it has a good ending. And I think maybe very few people actually know about this uh, from, you know, friends and colleagues and so on, um, is that I have, um, many people wouldn't be able to sort of tell this from the, from the outside, but I have um, struggled over the last uh, maybe five to seven years with some quite serious mental health kind of challenges. Um, nothing too bad on the sort of, you know, scale of how bad things can go, but um, but it's it's I guess it's maybe one of the few things that I haven't spoken to anyone about kind of publicly or except for very sort of close um, people, which are very few. So that's the thing that immediately came to mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, um, maybe not, like I said, not the most kind of like exciting thing, um, it's but. Still important. Uh, it's, oh yeah, definitely important. Um, and I'm happy to mention it as well because it's also something which, um, it's not one of those things which is like, you know, check mark solved, but it's, it's okay. It's, it's a journey from what I understand too. And it seems to me that you're pretty strong. And so people can look to you as a great example of someone who's making it through even despite. Challenges. Well, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's almost like almost anything else. Like, physical fitness or, or, or the well-being or things like that. Everybody can draw inspiration from anybody else, but just, just hearing it from somebody else, like that's, that's what always helps me with most yeah. things is, is, you know, you see somebody else like, oh, the first time I did this, I struggled, you know, and then you realize, oh, okay, it's not just me, even, you know, this person I look up to or work for is struggling with the same thing, so yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. And it's a good way to start the show, having that exposure to your, of yourself there. So cheers. Now, when it comes to your mindset, what was it like five years ago and how have you changed since then? Yeah, you know, of all that you sent me, so you sent me like a list of topics or questions that we might discuss and, and that I was at the right at the top. And it's the one I don't have a good answer for. <laughs> um, uh, because in, in a lot of ways, so much has changed. Um, but very incrementally, you know, like this, this year was odd with COVID and pandemics and all this stuff. Like it's very rare that you get some, something so big happening, you know, like kind of and so fast. Me. Yeah. And so fast. Exactly. Um, so a lot has changed. If I look back at five years ago, um, five years ago, I was a brand new dad. Um, whereas now I have an almost six year old <laughs> and a second child. Um, we moved country and house again, uh, my wife and I, with the kids. Um, Hopefully, we, you know, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, changed job sort of three times. So, you know, mm -hmm. it, when you look at it, like very little is the same from a practical 
you know, different house, different country, different job, uh, different family setup. Um, in, in, in a strange way, the mindset is sort of kind of the same in a, in a sense, because I remember five, six years ago, I was really sort of thinking like, I want to put some effort into starting a company um, and doing a couple of projects. And I didn't, mm. mostly for all of these reasons I just mentioned. And now I'm back there. So yeah. somehow it's sort of like I'm sort of back in, okay, now I have a bit of time that I can put to some of my projects that I've had on the back burner or at the back of my mind for, well, the last five years. Yeah. But it's yeah. interesting too, because it's been on that slow burner. You've been thinking about it in your brain throughout that time. And when you were speaking too, it made me think that there's a lot of things that happen in your life, whether it's external or internal, or if it's even just a matter of in your control, and what happens is a lot of the things we might focus on our mindset. We might focus on the actions we take, but usually you can't do both for the most part unless there's some big reason to. And you, you moved places, you moved jobs, you had a family. There was a lot of external things that came into your life. So you couldn't do anything internally for that time. Now you have more time to do that. Now you can do different external things. Uh, about a year ago, I moved into this new place, got a new car, a uh, first car in my life actually, got a new phone number, got a haircut. <laughs> Uh, basically just everything changed in my life all at once too and it's just interesting how I still had the same mindset but my whole life was different at that point even the job I think changed too and so I feel like right. it's a matter of keeping up with that change as much as possible and still sticking to yourself but letting yourself evolve too yeah it's it's um it's hard sometimes you sort of look back and you don't realize just how much has changed and where, where are you based by the way because I know you're in the states but I don't know which parts I uh, never I, asked you yeah, no worries. I am in the literal middle, literal middle of the U.S. So I'm in Missouri. So it's, okay. it's a place that's all right. But I'm also in the heart of Missouri, where I'm just literally in the middle of Missouri, in the middle states of the country. Oh, so I'm, fantastic. Okay. I'm as landlocked as you can get. It's crazy. And you had a good answer to that question, by the way. I would say. I think you okay, well, answer. thank you. Thank you. I'm glad. Um, I can usually sort of like... Um, come up with something but it, it's I guess I guess it's not that I don't have an answer but it was one of those things where I felt like what have you learned from your interviews with tech leaders or about the climate emergency at the moment yeah um, a few different things um, some of them not surprising I, th I mean the first thing and the first thing I learned so I've been speaking to all these people who are somehow somehow have come you know they're mostly people who are like not say denying that there's a climate emergency or a problem or that people are having an impact or something like that. Not that I do not want to speak to people like that, but that's who I've mostly spoken to. Um, and, and the thing is that generally speaking, the attitude is sort of like, uh, you know, somebody will fix it. <laughs> um, Someone, I'm someday. I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit and maybe doing a bit of an injustice to some people. It's not everybody. Right. Um, there's been some people I spoke to who in their companies are taking very specific and direct action. Um, but generally speaking, the attitude I've come across is, is that it's, it's um, a mixture of what can we even do about it? Right. There's nothing that we can do um, as well as somebody's working on it. So when somebody comes along with a better set of servers that we can use, we'll switch right away. Don't worry. <laughs> um, but we're not going to go away and do it now because that's not our core business. And whatever, we, whatever we're doing is pretty important. So we're going to stick to doing that. And um, that's kind of one general thing I've learned. The other thing I've learned is... People, people are, are actually quite willing to talk about this and partly because it's not being talked about as much as you would expect when you start focusing as I did a couple of years ago on environmental issues you sort of think oh yeah everybody knows about this it's in the news it's the you know people are talking about this and so on even looking back to my time in software companies uh, this is never an issue nobody talks about it you know the, the sort of the mythical water cooler conversation um, whether it's in slack or in person or at expos or whatever it's not an issue so 
whether that's because people don't care or it feels inappropriate, you know, and that kind of like, oh, it's a, it's not a work thing. So maybe I don't bring up my kind of environment of concerns in the office. Um, and so as a result, quite a few people have been willing to talk to me. Um, very, very kind of, you know, um, in a kind of outpouring way. <laughs> um, I, I had some of the conversations initially were really, really long as well because yeah. <laughs> they get an outlet uh, because yeah um and of course i was less structured as well myself but so those two things which yeah. is both encouraging and discouraging at the same time kind of normal i suppose when I you're suppose. dealing with a tricky issue i just wonder if part of that's just because we have this whole idea that it's taboo to talk about like in america for example or not america the u.s i mean particularly it's interesting how it's taboo to talk about your income like how much do you make when in reality, it's not actually that big of a deal to say, like, hey, I make this much. In fact, there's often times where if you're more entry level, especially talking about your income with your coworkers can identify situations where they're getting paid less than you or more than you for the same role. And that happens a decent amount of times. And I think that being able to talk about stuff that might be taboo, but climate change is not taboo per se. It's something that's prevalent. So I wonder how we can get that more common. Well, it's, it's not taboo in the sense that for whatever reason, the pay issue is, is it's not just in the US. Um, it's also in countries that I've worked, lived and worked and I've experienced it as well. I think in many cases. And it's problematic, right? Um, because in some, in, to some degree, you can understand that, you know, you don't want to kind of give your cards away. Maybe you negotiate a good pay or the employee. But actually... When you when you think through some of the issues in, involved around that, um, it it allows employers to get away with uh, pay gaps, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is essentially for exploitation, not even a form of exploitation, exploitation, whether that is paying, say, women less money than men just because of the gender uh, issue or else based on ethnic background or race or religion or things like that. Um, and these have been fairly well documented, right? And, and it's generally in, in those employers' interests to keep the salary a secret. Um, with, with climate and environment, it's kind of similar. Um, I don't want to point any fingers, not because I would, I, it's because I don't really know who to point it at, but um, the environmental issues have in the US. I mean, you know, we're in the middle of an election at the moment. <laughs> um, the climate, the climate issue is is uh, is a big one, right? And it's just become a thing where you're even here in the UK. If you if you want action to be taken on climate matters and environmentalism and sustainability and so on, you have to vote for a particular party, and you can't vote for the other one. It's just, it makes you aligned with a political party mm -hmm. with maybe you don't agree with the rest of the policies or some of their policies. Um, and so that makes it taboo because politics has also been a taboo topic in, in workplaces, right? So it's not, an, it's not an environmental issue that is the taboo part of it. It's the political issue that makes it taboo. A lot of workplaces, for example, in this sort of in the stated spirit of saying we want a great culture in our office and blah 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 so they say like no you know there's the basic stuff like no harass harassment or it will be tolerated you know certain things like that and then you've got things like well we don't discuss politics we don't discuss religion and we don't discuss um you know and because these things are contentious right you have a you have a, a company where especially during election times for example and suddenly somebody's like saying well i love trump and then you're like you're a fucking idiot <laughs> you know you know sorry I don't like that. um it's you know you don't want that environment in your company mm -hmm. rightly or wrongly i'm not judging that at the moment but then the climate issue has been lumped in with that so if you want action on climate change to use the example of elections at the moment you're a democrat if you don't if you're a Republican, then you don't care about climate change. That's the assumption people make, right? Yeah. Because of the party so leaders. And, and it isn't the case. It shouldn't be the case. It um, so that's my opinion for why it is a kind of a taboo uh, okay. subject in many places. Well, and when did you start doing these interviews? Was it pandemic related? Did that spare you to make them? 
No, actually the pandemic slowed me down. And really? yeah, because so I started about a year ago. So before uh, all this happened and it was one of those things where it was like a, a whim, you know, like I had this thing at the back of my mind for a while. I was doing some work for another company at the time. And I just sent out a bunch of emails to some people I knew, you know, would you hop on a call like this with me, talk about this and publish it. And I got a fantastic response, got a bunch of interviews recorded and then didn't realize because I'd never done a podcast before what I actually went into producing the, yeah. the, and publishing an episode. Um, and by the time I was, you know, wrapping up some of the recordings, getting to really sort of start publishing some of them, COVID hit. Well, first we had a baby. We had a new baby in January. So that set me back, you know, in terms of, not set me back is the wrong term, but, you know. Anyway, just, it sets you back a little bit because you're distracted. You're focused on that. From the point of view of work, it set me back. <laughs> And then COVID hit and then it was just, you know, the older kid was at home, work was up and down and I just put everything aside uh, for quite a few months and then go back to it in May or June or something like that. So, so a lot of the stuff I published in May, June were from much earlier er recordings and earlier, earlier in the year or late the last year. And then the stuff I'm publishing now is just from recent weeks. Mm -hmm. Since so now the interviews I'm doing, now, they're being published a bit more regularly um, mm -hmm. or a bit closer to the, to the time. But no, it wasn't COVID related. I think it I was, just saw the uh, dates around May. So I was like, oh, okay, must have been. <laughs> but yeah, no, it, that, that is exactly May is when I then first sort of got them up. But um, yeah. so if COVID hadn't hit, those dates would have been maybe March, mm -hmm. right? Kind of February, March. If there wasn't a baby, it would have been January, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> well, was, and I think yeah. that as long as you get them out, that's what really matters. Because a lot of times, even if it takes you a year, as long as you get it out. That's where I got to in the end. I was trying to be, sort of be too much of a perfectionist about the whole thing. Um, and even though you tell other people all the time, like, just ship it, just launch something, put it out there, see what people think, blah, blah, blah. When it's you, <laughs> it's different, isn't it? Um, and I uh, so sort of was agonizing about is the well logo perfect and you know what i mean like small things there's also the saying. idea of like hearing your own voice or seeing yourself on camera looking at the camera all these little things that you learn the more you create it took yeah, me yeah, a yeah. year to make youtube videos i started doing podcasting way before youtube but because i just couldn't get myself to feel comfortable on camera okay yeah it's it's, it's hard it's hard i for some reason i that somehow that didn't bother me too much because I've also been working remotely for about 10 years now. And so Zoom has been part of my toolkit for five, six years. And somehow doing these interviews on Zoom, I've been conducting work meetings like this for a long time. So it sort of felt familiar almost, right? Um, so that somehow wasn't, what, what bothered me more was like, I knew nothing about the topic. Really, when you get down to it, you know, I just knew what I would read and the headline, you know, like it's just like lay persons and uh, information or knowledge on the, on the subject of anything really to do with the environment. Um, maybe a bit more than average, you know, we had, yeah. had an interest, Cocktail but level. yeah, but that's like, because the average is so low, you know, <laughs> um, I don't mean it in an insulting way. It's just like, people don't know, you know, yeah. um, how have you proved then? Well, People mention stuff, you know, people would mention stuff to me on the podcast and I'd be like, oh, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and so I, then I go and look it up. Um, so par partly either mentioning topics or else mentioning resources. Um, one of the main resources I found, which has been, I just like constantly referring to it, is that there's an organization based in the States called Project Drawdown. Um, and they're they're a non-profit. I can't remember right now who funds them, but they're, you know, it's a good kind of uh, mix of funding sources. And they're a kind of academic institution that has done a, a real lot of research into all the things that can be done and should be done to draw down, to reach a point where we're drawing down more carbon than we're emitting from the atmosphere. Uh, and they have 
a huge amount of resources on the website, which are both very rigorous and academic, but also very approachable. So you can go there. You don't. You can, if you're not a scientist or environmentalist or anything, and you can just read a few things and really get the hang of it. It's a great resource. Yeah, I, I think I've come across in the past, but I put that into the description for people to be able to check it out. And so thank you for sharing that. And I wanted to ask you too, because I guess we're kind of getting on to the next question here. What inspired the fatal error blog that you made? Do you mean the project or the name or? Y yes, all of that. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. I guess, I guess if I ask a question like that, I deserve being told both of yeah. <laughs> and well, uh, the, the project itself, um, the, so the, the, the project is, is a podcast essentially. Um, but, but it wasn't meant to be a podcast. What it was is that when I first really started focusing on this and I thought, I really want to do something here. I, I didn't know what um, kind of industry, the world I know is software and tech. That's, that's where I spent 20 years or so uh, working, studying and, and so on. So I just did what everybody who does kind of any sort of marketing work tells you to do, right? Go and speak to the people you know. See if there's, if you learn something. There's, it's like market research in a way, uh, mm -hmm. or that kind of user research. So that was kind of it. But then I was thinking like, well, if I write to a CEO of a company and just say, hey, do you want to hop on a call with me and talk about climate change? <laughs> How do you <laughs> yeah. Their response is probably going to be, well, no. Yeah. But if I say, hey, it's a podcast, there, there's something that is a bit of a hook, uh, yeah, potentially. Can do. But, yeah, if they already have an interest in a topic where they're aligned, they're going to be, you know, and very few people say, you know, all publicity is good publicity yeah. as long as it's, you know, more or less aligned with what you're doing. So that's where it came from. Um, I wanted to speak to people about it. I figured that... I, I'm a big believer in open source in any case, so I would have been very happy to share all of this stuff. And then it felt like, well, rather than doing a lot of like writing and editing and all stuff, just record the conversation, turn it into a podcast and then see, uh, see if, if I can learn something from that. <laughs> the name, funnily enough, links to the kind of issue I mentioned at the beginning, because in <clears throat> Fatal Error in software is a sort of, I don't know if you're kind of familiar with that or your listeners would be, but it's, it's like, you know, when you get a bug or a, or something crashes or something like that. A fatal error is a kind of error a computer throws or an application throws, which usually means it's fatal for the app, right? Mm -hmm. So it has to be restarted. Like it's when you have to literally restart your computer or the app. Um, and I, I yeah, made so that, <laughs> and I ma yeah, and I made that connection in my head a, a while ago about the kind of, about when you're going through say a period of depression or anxiety or something like that and I remember buying that domain because I thought oh maybe I'll start a blog about like mental health or something I never did but then then it kind of fit with this because it felt like well if if we mess this up that is a fatal error for our species or we'll start over <laughs> you know so yeah. exactly so it was very it just well well, it was, if, if it felt well, this it's a bit macabre in a sense, right? <laughs> um, but it kind of was, I think people guess it. Um, we'll, we'll, yeah. Yeah, I like that though. And I think that's why I wanted to ask that too, because the, the naming moniker is really interesting. And then the whole story behind it is interesting as well. I'm hoping that it won't be a fatal error. So we don't get a BSOD of, in real life of the whole planet. No. But it's like, we have to do something about it. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So from management, the graphics designer, engineer, technologist, creative director, and more to podcaster and impact maker, there are a lot of roles you have filled. And so what sort of things have you learned in your polymathic history? <laughs> I never thought of, I never thought of this kind of stuff as being a polymath, to be honest. Um, well, that's why so I, I found it. Yeah, I found it, I found it intriguing. Um, I always thought of it as being more of a generalist, you know, um, which is, kind of the same thing i guess i guess when you say somebody's a polymath maybe there's an, a, a sort of a thing of you expect people to be deeper on the different things like more knowledgeable whereas generalist is more like jack of all trades kind of thing it's kind of it's it's a strange place to be 
um, I struggled with it sometimes because yes, I've done a bunch of different things. Partly because, partly because I sort of have an interest in different things, like just a kind of natural curiosity, but also because I get bored with stuff as well, which is a bit of a, you know, maybe not a great thing. Um, and on the one hand, it's great because you can turn your hand to many different things. Um, you can understand sort of lots of different parts of a business or an organization. On the downside, you often struggle with the thing of like, well, what am I? Yeah. You know, some people are very clear about like, well, I'm an engineer, you know, I write code and I love doing it. And I'm really great at like database code and, and you know, and optimizing database code. Like that's, that's who I am uh, or, or whatever, you know, or I'm, mm -hmm. a, I'm a ranger and I'm really good at taking care of forests on the, in the highlands of Scotland, you know, like that's me. I'm a Scottish forestry ranger. When you're a journalist or polymath or yeah. whatever, you know, where on the spectrum, it's hard to, you know, when people ask me what I do, it's hard to explain sometimes. And that's going to be a downside. Um, on the plus side, I can have conversations about many, many things rather than just forestry or database <laughs> code yeah. optimization. So. Well, that's the point too, I think. And that's one reason why I have people on the show like yourself who I would definitely consider yourself polymathic. Maybe not polymathic, like you said, this deep, deep level of knowledge, like expert level. That's fine. That usually comes from a lifelong of learning. But a gen expert journalist or journalist, whatever term fits your boat, it's a matter of kind of adopting that and really coming forth because you said you're naturally more curious and that's not a bad thing it's just in fact it's more human nature to be curious and we've grown up in a global society to like really wean down into one specialty mainly because of the industrial revolution and so what i try to do mm -hmm. on the show is try to exemplify all your traits so that way you can feel more like yourself and get into each of those different areas because we can talk about marketing we can talk about coding i'm not very much of a coder and i've been actually dealing with that this week building my new website Okay. <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, we can go in any of those different topics, and I hope that you can enjoy each one. So did you want to, did you want to sort of discuss one of them in particular, or? Um, I think in particular, uh, we're going to have some questions going into, like, WordPress and CMSs if we have the time. So that might be interesting. Mm -hmm. like your time at Automatic was interesting to me. Uh, but before we go to that, like you were kind of saying, too, you're interested in all these different areas, and they were indulging your curiosity. Any interesting thoughts about the intersection between those knowledge areas that you have? I don't know whether interesting is the right words, uh, but it's certainly useful, yeah. right? I remember when, when, I, was, when I was studying, uh, I studied computer science back when I was like, you know, at university. This was a while ago now, shockingly. Um, what, two years ago? Yeah, <laughs> right, but about 22, 21, 22 years ago is when I would have started. Um, yeah, so I remember at the time, so I was doing computer science, which is like an engineering degree, maths and computing. Uh, and I remember at the time, in Europe at least, it was becoming fashionable to have these cross-disciplinary courses like uh, business or economics and computing or psychology and engineering you know or, or the, the human computer interaction movement you know sort of user experience and, and things like that and one thing i found interesting in my work in some of the software companies i've worked at is that quite a few of the real i don't mean this as a sort of oh go do that right mm -hmm. but quite a few of the really good engineers I've worked with didn't study engineering. Uh, I, I remember one person in particular, for example, who was a graduate, uh, you know, he did classics. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like Latin, Greek and English, that kind of stuff. And he was just a wizard with Python, right? He, it just didn't make sense, you know? And I remember this guy was hired as a receptionist where I worked. He was just out of school. Um, mm -hmm. And within a few weeks, it was so obvious that he could contribute so much more in a software company that he he, be, he sort of got pivoted over, yeah. offered a role. In, I don't think of fully full software engineering role right away because he wasn't as you know as skilled in some respects. But I think the the you know I've seen people who, for example, do 
PhDs and then do something different. And I think what that brings is that you need to, you kind of learn how to learn, right? Yeah. So, and so people who can do some few different things are very good at change and very good at learning new things, picking them up quickly, you know, like things like kind of the concept of skim reading, you know, like you can skim a, a process or a concept and get it and like, okay, we're doing this. Okay. We're going to do this. this is how it's going to work. And you figure it out and then you can communicate it to people and, um, or, or, or get the hang of it. Whereas some other people can struggle with doing new things. Like nobody, they, you know, the, how it goes, like nobody likes change. Um, and I don't like change. Like it's change is stressful. You know what I mean? Like, even though we've changed a lot, like I've mentioned, we moved house and this and that and the other it's stressful. Um, but you get the hang of it. And so that's the big advantage that I found is that people are more so, adaptable, right? Yeah. When, when you kind of get the habit of learning new things. I would even not disagree, but like argue that, sure, like I, I totally agree that people can, like us, can skim really easily and get the cocktail level knowledge in some area. Bill Gates is a prime example where he'll read tons of books and get a deep level of knowledge in something, but not nearly as much as an expert. So he'll surround himself with a team of experts and go toe to toe with them but he'll still not know as much as them and will be able to learn from those people. Yeah. And I do think that because we have such a deep knowledge in many different areas, not super deep, but deep enough to where it's more than the average person, we can use that knowledge to translate to another knowledge pool. So if I'm learning carpentry, well, I might be able to transfer some of that knowledge to wiring a house and have the kind of parallels there and find the parallels. Easier. Oh yeah, for sure. Oh, for sure. I mean, one of the classic examples that I've seen is that people, for example, who do say engineering and then they learn a bit of management and you learn these kind of ways of managing teams, uh, you know, with like, uh, like agile processes, for example, if you've come across those kind of uh, methodologies, mm -hmm. Love project then you've, yeah. And then you find like a lot of these people have like these Kanban boards or agile boards in their home for like the stuff for the kids, you know? <laughs> um, and, and it's like, well, and they're working, their, their stuff at home is working really well <laughs> because of the stuff they learned there. And similarly, like you find, yeah, I remember um, actually the example, the very example that you mentioned, like an engineer I worked with also did a lot of woods carving. Uh, so, so not joinery, mm -hmm. exactly. I can't remember the term for it. It's not wood carving. It's um, uh, carpentry. No, not carpentry. Uh, like wood thing. turning. Is it turning? Is it like the thing where you can? I can't he remember exactly. Familiar, yeah, but I get what you he mean. did. So he did something with wood, and he was always sort of like, you know, Monday morning, <laughs> he'd yeah. be like, "Oh, this happened with my lathe, whatever," and then we can do this in the, in the like in the JavaScript framework that we're doing, and yeah finding the you know, parallels there yeah, yeah yeah for sure um yeah i think i think that happens a lot it's it just it's a different way of coming up with ideas i would say i don't think there's one way of coming up with ideas but but um touching on a lot of different things is is one good way i think of uh of coming up with solutions to problems you know the sort of turn your attention away, forget about something, and then something will, will click where you yeah. take something back. It's full of, I mean, the history is full of these examples, right? So like travelers going places and then they come back with like, hey, they do this over there. <laughs> and people will say, that's, you know, that's a terrible idea. And then, you know, a few years later, everybody's doing it. So. Yeah. It's literally just the people who are ahead of the bell curve, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to put it that way. So something I ask all my guests is, what is a polymath to you? I suppose, I suppose really the best answer I have is what I, what I, just, what I mentioned earlier. It's like a, a sort of a step up from a generalist, right? Mm -hmm. So I would never consider, I would never have described myself as a polymath. Um, I was kind of flattered to get an email from you saying, you know, putting it in that terms. But essentially, essentially somebody who is, like the definition of the term, as I understand it, is is somebody who is knowledgeable in a, in a, in a, you know, in a, a number of subjects, right. Or accomplished in a number of skills rather than, rather than just say one. 
right? So and the classic one is, is Da Vinci, who yeah. could do everything, right? Like everybody, everybody's hero, right? Like when this, you know, he could design helicopters, build castles, war machines, paint pictures, you know, he could do everything. And, yeah. He and, designed a city at one point. Right. I'm not surprised. I didn't know that, but I'm not surprised. He's, he's that kind of person. Um, so that's the classic one, right? And I think there are way more people who are polymaths than, Thank you. <laughs> than you would think. Thank you know, you. Um, Finally. the truth is that um, not everybody maybe yeah. can say that they're generalists slash polymaths, jack of all trades for what are considered to be useful things like jobs, job related stuff, right? Uh, very few people are both mathematicians and, you know, and engineers and classicists and anthropologists or whatever. Um, but most people can do a bunch of things, you know, a lot of people can do a lot of things like, well, like full just think of, like well, you know, and not, and, and not just, I mean, yeah, so first of all, yes, like you took a full stack developer, certainly there's a lot of depth you can go in, in, in every bit of the stack. So yes, you're kind of a generalist there. But also outside of that, so many full stack developers are really good at cooking and, you know, and quite a lot of them can grow a lot of veg in their back gardens. Yeah. Um, and a lot of them are maybe backpackers or campers or, you know, there's a lot of knowledge for each thing. And just because something is a hobby or not something that you can get paid for doesn't mean doesn't mean that it it should be discounted as, yeah. as knowledge. I so totally agree. so it's kind of a fancy word for for a person with varied interests, I would say. But then maybe in a more sort of useful sense, it's somebody who has a lot of interests and then at least at least pursues a few really well. Like you can say that like, well, you, you're really good at the carpentry, you're really good at the podcasting, you're really good at the marketing, you know what I mean? Like there's a few things. So that's kind of what I would say. What I'm are your sure top three skills then? Well, talking to people is one. I'm, I'm, I, I found it hard to accept that because it's, it felt like a self-congratulatory uh, kind of thing, but I am. Um, okay. I've, <laughs> I've been kind of. Uh, I'm 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 good at talking to people, getting information off of them, not in a sneaky way. I mean, you know, just in a kind of researchy uh, yeah. kind of way. Um, I'm good at managing people or at least I enjoy it, let me put it that way. Um, and by managing people, I don't mean the nitty gritties or things like that, but just Do working with, that? yeah, not, and, and yeah, not the kind of paper pusher type of thing, but more of the sort of um, leader, setting goals, not necessarily being the leader as a sort of like, oh, I'm the kind of one in front, but um, creating sort of the, creating a good space, a good culture, um, in a team or in a, or in a group. I think I'm pretty good at marketing. Um, I mean, I've, it's, it's kind of a weird one because marketing is one of those things which is almost as generic as saying like, I'm good at science. You know, like it depends what you're doing it for. <laughs> um, but I've had a few success stories. So I would say I'm good at that. Like the marketing design intersection, like designing products, designing messages, you know. I love marketing. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. So those, those are the three things I would pick. Um, I like that. That's interesting, Richard. I appreciate that. It's just kind of curious to see because from what I researched, it does actually seem to be that way from what I got from you. And, okay. Yeah. yeah. Pivoting a bit. Uh, interesting enough, you actually spent a lot of time with Automatic from WordPress and Jetpack. Mm -hmm. What do you think of WordPress now, considering that it has changed over years, obviously? Yeah, I mean, I still use it, you know, I, <clears throat> I think, so first of all, I still use WordPress. Most of the sites I have give some kind of like WordPress backend. I'll be completely honest, that is mostly because I'm familiar with it, not because it's necessarily the best tool for the job. Mm -hmm. And that's because I'm at the point in my life where unless I really need to, I'm not going to go and research new things like tools. Uh, you know, if it's working, I'm just going to go the quickest routes, right? If I have like half an hour to set up a new site, 
I'm just going to go with something I know I can do it super quick. Um, you mentioned ghosts before, and I've been kind of interested in what they're doing because I, I, they're sort of like what WordPress was. Yeah, like 10 years ago. Like that. You know, 10, 15 <laughs> years ago, right? And they're kind of that. And there's a few others as well. There's Kirby. Um, yeah, this is a few other kind of approaches to how it's handled and so on. Um, how CMSs are handled. And I think, I think WordPress is fine. There's a great community around it. It's there's some, they've made some kind of like big changes recently, right? In the last year or like so Gutenberg with the new, yeah, the Gutenberg editor. I actually kind of like Gutenberg stuff. to be honest, but. I do, I do. There's such an uproar about it. Um, and it's fine. I think it's, yeah. I think, I think it's long overdue actually. Um, and it doesn't go far enough in some, in some respect. I think I think WordPress is sort of also become a little bit big now, right? In a, in a in slightly unhealthy way in some respects. Unhealthy for the concept of open source software web, not for itself. I think it's in web. Well, and I felt that it was very clunky because I've used both .org and .com WordPress over the years. .com was my first one, and back then it might have just not have been as good as it is now, too. But I had issues with it, and I still had to took a real big learning curve, despite the fact I learned pretty quick. For some reason, I couldn't get the hang of WordPress until recent years. And I don't know, like something about the plugins and how the whole admin is, just it bogged me down, which is why I actually moved I'm moving to Ghost now. So what is your opinion then? Because you said you're interested about Ghost. What is your thoughts on that? I don't have thoughts about Ghost. Like, I, I, when it, my thoughts about Ghost are simply that, so I know about it. I know they had done like a kickstart, I think, to raise funding originally. And I remember reading some interviews with the founder. And, you know, increasingly I've heard more people mention it, which is why I've been sort of interested. Um, and I like things which are open source as a principle. Not that they're always the best <laughs> tool for the job, but yeah, with, I mean, you know, the biggest criticism I worked, I worked, so I've used WordPress myself for something like 10 years or more. Um, and I worked well more than 10 years because it would have been five years when I, yes, more like 15 years. Um, and I worked for about five years for automatic. Right. And a lot, I spoke to a lot of customers, a lot of, people who use .com.org, self-hosted, not whatever. The complexity of it is what comes up over and over again. And people work their way through it. And some people like it. Like, you know, there is a sense of DIY-ness about yeah. it, which people like. You know, it's like the IKEA effect. It's like, I built this, you know. <laughs> or I followed the instructions, but I made it, you know. Like, I stitched the plugins together and all of that. But it is clunky. Um, in, in that sort of, in, in getting the hang of it, especially when you compare it to some of the more recent uh, site builders like Squarespace or Wix, where somebody who has zero experience with the stuff, it's like using, it's like using PowerPoint, right? Or that kind of thing, like, it's exactly, and they're just not comparable. You, well, I will say I use the WYSIWYG editors for WordPress. I tried all of them, Beaver, uh, Word, WordPress Bakery. Oh, yeah, I don't like either of those. Uh, Divi, and I use Elementor, which is what I've been using now. Have you seen my It's sign? the best one, I think. Yeah, but even that, I, I'm not super happy with. This one. Oh, it's the best one, but I use none of them. Yeah. yeah so just put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, they and um, maybe maybe I'm doing them a service in some respect. Like I don't mean that they're bad products. They're really good actually. Um you you could do a lot of stuff with them. But like maybe once you have a certain amount of um, WordPress kind of knowledge, then you wouldn't use that sort of thing. It's a bit like overkill you know, on the way. You, yeah. Oh well it's a bit like yeah, the, the, the sort of like, you know, the analogy is like if you if you're a graphic designer, for example, you would never use a pre-canned template mm -hmm. uh you know from like microsoft word right or or something like that you just kind of make your own because you can kind of like get it better closer to what you actually want and so that's the problem with these with these uh, drag and drop site builders i think and then of course there's all the kind of criticism they get about they're slow loading because there's tons of html and javascript and this and they're inefficient and they sort of mixed um, 
uh, responsiveness, kind of uh, how well they do fare on different devices and things like that. So I can't you know. get my uh, page speed up to save my life. I tell you what. <laughs> yeah, it's a hard. It's a hard. Uh, and it's hard, you know, I mean, RP has become much easier to create a website, but it's yeah. not, it's not an easy thing, you know, when you yeah. get, to, get down to it, it's, it's a bit of work involved. Well, for me, I am, I'm an Omni content creator. I have videos and polycasts and blogs and even a side blog that's more of a codex in a way. So I have a lot of different content types and I was going to use a plug again for custom post, custom types for WordPress, but with ghost, they don't do categories. They don't really do custom post types. They only do tags and you can separate them okay. from tags. And that's one thing I was thinking like, okay, well, it's not gonna be as good, but it'd be interesting that it might solve my problem because with WordPress, there's so much options that it actually bogged me down, prevented me from creating with, with ghost. I'm thinking that'll get me to create. This leads me to that question, though. What are the problems that you think that maybe CMSs can solve? I think one of the other sort of uh, things that <laughs> I'm sort of been kind of fairly deep on, I suppose, is design, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it did a chunk of time working very much on user experience design and, and product design, and a lot of that that kind of work informed a lot of my thinking on how to go about doing. Actually, this is a good example for your question before. I should have thought of this. But that, that, that informed a lot of how I approach sort of, for example, other kinds of work like marketing work, right? So, so yeah. people in design do things like usability tests, and it turns out you can do usability tests on your marketing materials, for example, you know, things like that. Um, but one of the things is, is inclusivity. And this has become a fashionable term lately because of diversity and inclusion and, and so on. But what a lot of CMSs try to do and a lot of these big products like Facebook and so on, is they try to be a one size fits all uh, product, right? So like, well, we're gonna be so flexible or else we're gonna nail some fundamental principles so well, this is gonna work for everybody and everybody should use Squarespace or Wix or WordPress or whatever because it's brilliant. And it turns out that's just not the case, you know, like unsurprisingly, people have different problems. And for example, <laughs> yeah, I remember doing this research project, uh, <laughs> being part of this research project at Automatic, um, where we had this theory that we were seeing a lot of people, a, a big increase in uh, people creating like e-commerce stores, right? Uh, at Shopify, using Shopify, which was a competitor to Automatic. Not to WordPress exactly, but to Automatic, because, yeah. exactly because of the WooCommerce connection. Um, and I remember this theory we had, we're like, well, we need to target small enterprises, like the small kind of the, the micro enterprises, you know, the barber, you know, the, the, the Chinese shop on the corner, like all these people who don't have websites and so on. And a bunch of people went to do some research, including myself. And, you know, like you find out these crazy things, like some people are like, well, some people don't have email addresses hmm. um, because they don't need one. And some people have an email address but they don't have a phone or a laptop to check it on. Um, and so they check it once a week when they visit their whatever friend. And uh, some people just have a phone. They have a number, no email address, just a number. Because you can, you can sign up for Facebook, for example, with a phone number and a few other things. And you just use Facebook as your messaging tool. And so all these assumptions that we had around like, well, we just need to email these people and get them, you know, like that all falls down. And, and all the theories you have about like, oh, we'll make it like that you can set it up in a couple of hours. And the guy running the Chinese shop doesn't have a couple of hours, you know, yeah. he's got like five minutes. Um, and so no CMS is going to solve for that we discovered at the time. There were other things that we did and it was a kind of interesting, but the point is that the, the more sort of, the bigger these products become, the more they try to solve everybody's problem, the less they're gonna be successful at doing that. Like WordPress was successful initially at creating blogs. That's what it was for. And that's why it's confusing now still to a lot of people <laughs> to <coughs> to understand like what the hell is the difference between a post and a page mm -hmm. why is that even there you know nobody would would uh, nobody would engineer that into a brand new cms now i think the question should be like <laughs> 
whose problems, right? Like whose problems can the CMS solve? Because, because the idea of a content management system, that's what CMS means, right? Like what, what content won? Yeah. That, and that was your question, right? Sort of like, can I ask where you were coming? Because you were like, well, I've got text and video and sound and other things, but also whose content, right? Is it, is it somebody like me who at the moment has quite a lot of spare time you know, um, I mean, spare time, yeah. <laughs> but f a fair amount of time, um, and who has actually quite a lot of lengthy thoughts, or is it the kebab shop down the road? Could have seen micro updates. Uh, yeah, who just needs to say that they're open or not, basically, and that some things on the menu were not. You know, so I don't know enough to say that there's like a market opportunity for this or that or the other. But I think a lot of these tech products have kind of emerged sort of by accident in a sense. We're like, well, we make blogs and then now it turns out people want sites and people want shops. And so we've added all this kind of stuff, WooCommerce and Jess back and blah, blah, blah. And somebody coming up with something new now, I would, I would personally, I would advise starting with well, whose problem are you solving? Whose content are you publishing? Mm -hmm. And if it was Dustin, right? I'd be like, okay. So if I'm seeking to create a business, <laughs> I'd be like, well, okay, well, how many people like you are there? Mm -hmm. Right? If it's just you, then, then maybe my business is building a website for you that is really just yours and somehow convince you to pay me a certain amount of money a month, like to keep it running for you or something like that. Um, the likelihood it is, it isn't just you, right? And sort of work out then how big that group of people might be and see what well, sort of well, things that you want to do, right? Yeah. Let me pivot the question then, because I think the question was a little too broad and I have a specific one that I was wanting to ask you considering the vast mm -hmm. different content types and I don't want to take up too much time with this, but it's one I was want to ask you, what would you think it would take for a CMS made around creating omni-channel content, not just blogs, videos, and podcasts, but more importantly, the micro content scheduled out afterwards, getting those audio clips for the uh, podcast mm -hmm. or the video clips for the videos and the little tweets from it. Because I've tried over 90 different social media management tools and hardly like 88 of them can't do what I need them to do. And the other two are iffy at best. What and do so, you need them to do so? Yeah, what I want to do is that for every post, video, and polycast, I want to be able to share it out in a campaign. The day of, a day later, a week later, a month later, half a year later, and a year later. Because most of my content's evergreen, I want to be able to send it out at that echoing manner. Because when I look at the data and all the different blogs talking about social media marketing, that's one of the things they talk about is spreading it out as much mm -hmm. as possible. But none of these tools can really do it very well. Missing letter, sort of, but it can only do blogs, not videos. So I was wanting to make my own where I automatically had those campaigns built into each of the content pieces. Yeah, I... Rebel Mouse kind of does something like that, I guess, but Rebel Mouse is also kind of a joke in a way. Yeah, you know, I've, 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 I've certainly heard that of that product, but I don't think I, I've ever used it. Um, I mean, one thing that I would kind of think of um, right away is that you would need... For this to be really smart, right, or, or clever, and this is maybe, I don't know, it's a core feature or a nice to have, but if you're figuring out where you're starting from, and I'm guessing that with you, it's starting with video or audio, right? For me, so, it's right, written, actually. Most people do video, but I actually do blog first. What do you mean? No, but what I mean is, the, so for example, for this, for this episode, right, that we're doing here, um, you mean you do a blog first, like that's how you'd start the marketing campaign? Um, for so I'm thinking the, the interviews are my secondary series. The main series, the Omni content, starts as a blog post, gets turned into a slideshow, gets turned into a video, then audio cut out for a podcast. So I actually start the whole sequence from the blog. Okay, but do you start with the, like, do you start with the written thing mm -hmm. and then produce the video, or do you start by producing, okay. Yeah. Well, what I, so maybe what I was thinking doesn't quite work then, but what I was thinking is that there's like a video. So thinking of this, what we're doing now, this process, yeah. we're having something that can go through this video. And well, I mean, first of all, transcribe it well enough. 
right? A lot of the transcription tools are, yeah, some which are pretty good, um, but they're not that great. But then being able to match that to video clips, right? And like have suggested clips and then being able to just extract bits and pieces out of it as videos with the text. Somehow that feels like a part of it, mm-hmm. sort of getting meaning out of the, out of the video somehow. Um, now, in, in your case, you're sort of like putting it the other way around, where you're starting with the with the written version. Um, that's a tough one. I'm, I'm, I don't think I know enough well, right now. I think that, just to put it in perspective, I, I like your idea. And that's what most people do. So they take the video, transcribe it, cut out of yeah. the audio, and then they have all three con- content types. Since I was a blogger first, that's what really kind of made me stuck with writing first. But I would do think it would be interesting if basically it's three to separate tools in one in a way. So you could do that main one where it's all in one feed and the AI helps chunk it out and micro content it out. But I was kind of thinking more on the lines of the blog post is this way and it cuts out certain sections. Perhaps you can have predetermined sections too. Mm-hmm. So like you have the spot that's a tweet that's automatically a tweet that you just wanted to make that paragraph, something like that. And so maybe there's predetermined slots or something like that. That's kind of how it can get the context. And, but it's more your work, not AI. Yeah. yeah same yeah. thing for the video and for the po- podcast part where it has certain aspects behind how you build it. I don't know. I don't think that's good. It could it's something that it's something that could work as a, so I kind of get what you're saying, I think. Um, and it, it sort of makes sense. Sorry. It makes sense as in like, I can see the use case for it. You could almost see things like that working as a, or maybe as a simple way of trying something out rather than a CMS, but as a plugin. Mm. Right? So we are speaking of WordPress before, but it's not just WordPress that does plugins. I mean, I want to say Ghost does plugins as well, but I'm not sure. Uh, kind of, yeah, sort of, yeah. I know uh, you can do plugins for... We don't have to spend too much time on this. I just few of the others, yeah. But that could be an interesting way of trying it out, especially now with like where you have, if you want to go for a WordPress audience, um, there's, you know, with blocks, it kind of works. Mm-hmm. Uh, where, where sort of what you're saying, where you kind of like pick something out and it becomes a block of content that you're going to reuse somewhere else um, and maybe have that be scheduled as a tweet or a social post or so on. It's hard. I know, I know it's like even just the simple things of like, <clears throat> like you do a blog post, it has a link to a video, it has the audio file for the podcast and then just doing the tweets for it and all this stuff. It's a pain. Like, I'm not going to say that it's super hard work, like, you know, backbreaking or anything like that, you know. <laughs> I mean, but it's just keeping, it's just keeping it all in, in place. Like, you need, like, just, I don't know what you do, but, like, you know, maybe have a checklist or something and then, like, just yeah. going through each one by one. Like, have I've done it for you. this thing. <laughs> You're, you'll nerd out on it. You'll love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's like, m- mine is quite straight simple, actually. It's, I, I, but, yeah, but, you know, like, I remember putting a bit of effort looking for tools that maybe would sort this out reasonably well. I didn't come across anything that inspired me much. I'm sure there's maybe something better than my Google Sheet, but that's where it's, that's where it's at at the moment. I think when, some, when, when stuff, and I've heard this from other folks as well, so I think when, when there's stuff that is being handled by a, by a Google Sheet or a spreadsheet or something, it's probably right for at least a plugin, <laughs> if not a fully fleshed CMS solution. I, I use Notion, which is a very more advanced version. Yes, of things, but yeah, yeah. I, I recently started using Notion as well. Um, yeah, but still, I mean, yeah. it's it's again, Notion is like a kind of a fancy spreadsheet, right? In the sense of like you can use it for anything. It's not for podcasters. It's not for bloggers. Um, so once you're using something like that, it could be Trello, right, or yeah. whatever. Yeah. So what is the purpose of kick one? <laughs> so that's something I'm working on at the moment. Right? It's, it's, I'll, I'll preface this by saying right away, even the, even the name is up, is, is going to be, is, is different. Like that's one of those stories where like I had a domain name running around and I just attached it to this project. But mm. basically when I started the podcast, I had an interest in sort of began developing my interest in this uh, space of climate and environmentalism. Um, and I realized that I did want to dedicate more time to the issue, full time if possible, 
but that means you need to make money, you need to earn a living. So then I began looking around for what I could do in the space, ranging from maybe working for a company that's doing something, you know, and all of those lines. But I've always wanted to start sort of, uh, I actually started companies before, none of them successfully. So this was like a good, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what they say, right? <laughs> um, and, uh, so, so this felt like a good time to start something new. And what I'm, what I'm doing with this is I have a small team I'm sort of working with and we're looking at carbon sequestration, which is carbon capture, um, but not, not artificial, not man-made stuff, but natural, a natural approach to it. So you may have come across these projects where people are like planting trees in various places and so on. And there's a lot more that you could do rather than just planting trees in Kenya. Mm -hmm. uh, part of which is start planting trees at home as well. Yeah. Uh, because Definitely. people tend to, well, yeah, you know, there's sort of, I, I have some, I always have some concerns about planting things, doing things like, oh, Kenya will solve it for us, you know, we're like, we carry on doing what we're doing and we plant a bunch of stuff in Madagascar and then they figure out how to make a living off of it. And that's a bit maybe that's uh, cynical, but, but my interest is basically there's a lot of potential in what is called soil carbon capture and soil being the actual soil and the stuff you grow on it. And we've been looking at projects that we can do in this area around either crowdfunding or marketplaces or these kinds of models where we bring people who have the ability to capture carbon through their land in touch with people who either want to or need to offset their footprints, either personal or, or their enterprise and sort of bring these two together. So you want to offset the footprints, your carbon footprints uh, that you're, you know, in your personal life, right? Or from your work. And I would be there, that would be the person telling you like, well, actually the best way to do it is to give that money to a farmer, right? Or a forester rather than this other, this other thing. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for why I would believe that to be the case. Uh, part of it is that it's, it's not just a climate issue, then it becomes like it helps livelihood, it helps habitats, uh, rewilding, things like that. So, yeah. but it's super early stages. It's very exciting because we've just been accepted to an accelerator here in the oh, UK. Nice. So it's kind of cool, um, but very early stage. But you should talk to Alex Dunstan. He's very known in the VC space. And I think that with his mentality, he might be a good pair. I have come across him recently. I want to say, and a person will correct me if I'm wrong, that one of the people who's working with me on this knows him. I had <laughs> or him something like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. He's a he's the he's a VC who worked for Sachi, is it? Yeah, Sachi. Am I? Uh, yeah. Okay. So yeah, super cool. Yes. That's why I thought you might resonate with him. Yeah, for sure. Okay. That's, that'll be a that'll be a nice call to action for me to go and drop him like a cold email. <laughs> yeah. So, what sort of ideas or innovations do you hope to see on Kick? I'm more interested in how we go about doing things rather than the technology behind it. So, one of the things that I'm more interested in recently is kind of the kind of structures that organisations adopt to run their business. Mm -hmm. Typically, we've sort of ended up in a situation where if you're a for-profit organization, then you're kind of absolved from doing the right things um, because charities will do the good stuff, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, Black and white mentality again, too, where if you're yeah. this kind of company, you can't do that. It's, no. Yeah, and I sort of that's that's where I personally want to do something different um, and not radically different. There are many other companies already doing stuff like, you know, if you've come across the terms like B corporations or, or uh, what are they called, public benefit corporations, like Kickstarter is a public benefit corporation, for example, um, and Patagonia is a B Corp, if I remember correctly. Um, but basically, you know, I'm kind of interested in how things can be more equitable in the organization. So somebody I spoke to recently for the podcast, which was published last week, I think, actually, Astrid Schultz, 
she made a statement which made me think like, yeah, shit. Like, she said like, there's no law that says that a CEO needs to be paid more than anybody else in the company. And it's true, you know, like when you see the, the big differences between what people are paid in organizations, it's, it's not necessary. Now, I don't mean that everybody should necessarily pay the same, but, but maybe they should, why not? Maybe it's everybody should. Company too. Right. So that's the kind of innovation I'd like to, I'd like to be, um, you Careful know, now, if, talk if, about money's taboo. If, if we, <laughs> but like, exactly. So it's that sort of thing, right? It's like where it, it wouldn't be taboo. Yeah. I've, I've a lot of admiration for these companies who've done some different things in this area. Like I think it's Buffer. Is it mm. Buffer? Buffer's who, really cool. Pu pu who published their salaries. Um, mm. uh, on, just online. So you can just go and see what everybody earns. Um, and I think, I think that's the sort of thing where I'm more interested in, like, you know, because you mentioned innovations, um, which given the space as well, it, it also, it's important to kind of inspire confidence, right? If somebody's giving you money to do something good, they want to know that you are actually doing something good. Yeah. So it kind of matches. Well, that, that was great. I, I, uh, everything you said today is super interesting. And I, I, I wish we had more time to go into some of these other questions here, but thank you for coming on. Where can people find you online? Well, I suppose the best way at the moment is uh, the, the podcast website is, there's all my contact information there. So that's fatalerror.blog. I have basically all your links in the description, so don't worry. Okay. I mean, my email address is richard.fatalerror.blog. So happy for people to sort of email me there. Um, They'll cold call you, you know, cold email. Yeah, go. go for it. That's as spam folder as I've worked. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what could be a call to action for the audience then today? With respect to like the, the projects I'm working on and things like that. Or I, yeah. I think, you know, yeah, no, I think, I think the main thing at the moment is uh, for me, I think a lot more people should uh, be just a little bit more aware of what, of what uh, impact we're having on the environment. Um, so if I had one call to action, it would be to visit our website I mentioned before, drawdown.org drawdown.org just have a look around have a browse around there's it's it's because it's a hopeful website but it's hopeful in the sense of like we can climb this mountain but it's still a fucking mountain so yeah. it's there and so you need to both i think i think more people need to be like yeah okay this is a lot of work there's a lot of work we need to do uh, and i think that website does a good incredible job of explaining what's involved so that would be it. Yeah, I usually ask called the action, called the growth, but it seems like you kind of combine both of those there together, which is interesting. And okay. yeah, once again, this is Dustin Miller, Poly Innovator, and Richard Muskett on the Polymath Polycast. Thanks for joining me, man. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh -huh.